الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله وأصحابه الذين اجتبى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان لأهل المدينة ومن حولهم من الأعراب أن يتخلفوا عن رسول الله أن يتخلفوا عن رسول الله ولا يرغبوا بأنفسهم عن نفسه ذلك بأنهم لا يصيبهم ظمأ ولا نصب ولا مخمصة في سبيل الله في سبيل الله ولا يطعون موطئا يغيظ الكفار ولا ينالون من عدو نيلا إلا كتب لهم به عملا صالح إن الله لا يضيع أجر المحسنين وقال تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اصبروا وصابروا ورابطوا واتقوا الله واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we extend from the depth of our heart innermost gratitude that He has gifted us with the greatest of gifts the gift of our faith because our faith, my brothers and sisters, is the means by which we can know Him. The means by which we can know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And often we forget His greatness. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an encourages us to reflect over the creation of the heavens and the earth, to ponder over the greatness of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And by looking at the greatness of what Allah has created, we can get a small glimpse of His greatness. SubhanAllah, when you look out into the heavens, when you look at some of the images captured by the Hubble Space Telescope, you look out and you look and you see millions of bright stars. But in fact, those are not stars that you are looking at. Each one of those bright lights is a galaxy which contains millions of stars. Our universe compared to our galaxy is like a ring in a desert and our galaxy compared to the cluster of galaxies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created is like a ring of a desert and those cluster of galaxies compared to the observable universe is like another ring in the desert and the entire observable universe compared to the kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nothing that kursi compared to the arsh is like a ring in the desert and that arsh compared to Allah Again, nothing. We can't fully comprehend what Allah has created within the cosmos and within the universe. We can't comprehend the size of our galaxy alone, not to mention the size of the cosmos that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And yet that one who created everything and knows everything, past, present, and future, he wants to have a relationship with us. And what a noble position we've been given as human beings. We've been designed specifically as that special creature, that creation of Allah who has the opportunity to have the love of Allah to have the love of the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And in fact, when you read the Qur'an, there is only one creature, there is only one of God's creation that is described as having Allah's love. And that is the human being. You don't even read that description of regarding the angels. See, the angels worship Allah without choice. They're created in a way where they face no temptation. Therefore, that true divine love isn't befitting for them because they don't have that desire, that temptation to sin. There's no struggle in their journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas human beings, through our struggle, through the temptations that we face, through the difficulties we face in holding on to our faith, when we choose to overcome our desires, when we choose to overcome the evil temptations that we are surrounded by, and we choose to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through that we can achieve His love. Inna Allah yuhibbul muhsineen. Allah loves those who do good. And that reminds me of an ayah which I wasn't planning on speaking about, but if only we were to act on this ayah, you would find that our problems within our homes, our problems within our masajid, our problems within our community, within our country, with our world, would be solved. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believers as who? al Those who restrain their anger. And if you look at your life and the problems you face, you can see that maybe many of the problems that, that you have or that you have faced or that we have within our community are born out of anger. In a moment of anger, a person can cause such damage that a lifetime can never repair. So Allah describes the believers, yes, people will hurt you. Yes, people will oppress you. Yes, people will wrong you. 
will disappoint you. And you may feel a fire within your heart at that moment, but do you act on that fire or do you restrain it? Allah describes the believers as those who hold back their anger. And then after they swallow their anger, what do they do? They forgive. And a sign of forgiveness is that you never mention what that person did to you again. If you tell them today I forgive you and tomorrow you remind them of the wrong, then that's not true forgiveness. And if you want Allah to forgive you, then be quick to forgive others. Just imagine Allah will treat you as you treat others. You keep reminding people of the wrong they did to you, maybe Allah may keep reminding you of the wrongs you've done to Him, which is countless. Our faith is a faith that teaches us to treat others as we wish our Lord to treat us and knowing that our Lord witnesses how we treat others. Allah is gentle, is loving, is merciful. He loves for us to be loving and gentle and merciful. But that's not enough. He says, first, the believers are those who restrain their anger. Secondly, the believers are those who forgive. And it's easy to forgive when somebody hasn't really hurt you. The real test of forgiveness is when somebody truly has hurt you and you forgive them for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you go beyond. Wallahu yuhib. And Allah loves. Now when we read in the Qur'an, Allah loves, we should take a moment, we should pause, we should stop, we should recognize that this is a great sentence, that Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the sun, the moons, the galaxies, everything belongs to Him. Nothing exists in and of itself, everything exists only out of the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That creator loves. Who does Allah love? We want to make sure our name is after that word. And how can we put our name after that word? By taking on the qualities that Allah describes following that word. So then Allah says, in the law you hib, Allah loves, and that's where the hearts of the believers jump with joy because they say, okay, this is my opportunity to be those that the Creator loves. Who is it that the Creator loves? Wallahu hib al muhsinin. Allah loves those who show goodness and beauty and kindness to others. It's one thing to forgive someone, but Allah loves those who do ihsan. Ihsan is to go above and beyond in showing goodness to others. So first you forgive, then you give a gift that is a Ihsan. First you forgive, then you help. That is Ihsan. May Allah make us such people. If we can really control our anger with our spouses, with our children, with our colleagues, with our brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, we find ourselves as a community afraid to show anger against the bigots and the racists, but then showing anger with our brothers and sisters. That's not the quality of the believers. So that we sh control our anger, we forgive others, and then we engage in ihsan. And Islam, our faith, is the vehicle, as I started this khutbah by, by which we can come to know this creator of the heavens and the earth, the owner of everything. So look at your body, it's amazing. It's symmetrical. You have two hands, two ears, two eyes, a nose, a tongue. You didn't fashion yourself in this most perfect of forms. You didn't design yourself to be as you are. You didn't gift yourself consciousness, rationality, intellect, heart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who willed for you to be. And Islam is the vehicle by which you can come to know your Creator. Islam is the vehicle which teaches us three key things that most people are ghafilun, are negligent of. It teaches us where we came from. We came by the will of Allah. He willed for us to be and therefore we are as individuals and as a nation. Secondly, Islam teaches us who we are with. We are always with Allah. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ Allah is with you wherever you are. وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بصير. Allah sees all that you do. And that's another problem. In a state of anger, in a state of hate, in a state of um, sadness, and sometimes in a state of joy, we forget وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ The true test of faith is when we are in a state of anger, or we're in a state of sadness, or we're in a state of joy when our emotions are acting up, do we remember Allah sees what I'm doing? Allah hears what I'm doing. Allah is with me. And as Jalisu man dhakarani, I am in the company of those who remember me in a hadith Qudsi it stated. So we came by the will of Allah. We are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ultimately, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's our final destination. Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kathan fa mulaqi, a human being. Allah tells us in the Quran, and the greatest tragedy of Muslims today is our disconnect from the Quran. And if you're not aware of it, take some time today, 
half an hour, 45 minutes and read the Quran in Arabic and then read the translation and see if your heart changes. See if your heart feels more alive. And when you feel the life your heart has by reading the Quran, then you recognize how dead your heart may have been for the last few days or the last weeks or God forbid months when you haven't opened up the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا When the messenger complains, My Lord, my people have taken the Qur'an as something to be neglected. As Muslims, we believe we have the words of the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And we're the only people who claim to have the unchanged words of the Creator. And it's amazing, really, the one who created the Milky Way, the sun, the moon, the stars, everything in existence has spoken to us directly and we have His literal words. And yet how often do we open those words? How often do we reflect upon them? How often do we act upon them? That shows us the kind of love and connection we have with Him. May Allah protect us from being those people who neglect His words and neglect His message. Because that's a sign of a lack of love. Islam is a religion of love, really. That we love our Creator and thereby, therefore we want to come to know our Creator. And ultimately, we will return to our Creator. And right now what we're doing is we're simply writing our story. We are writing the story that we will present our Creator when we meet Him. And literally, it's a book. You read the Qur'an, whoever gets the book in the right hand will be joyous, successful. Whoever gets their book in the left hand will be regretful. And words cannot describe the joy on the day when you meet your Creator and He gives you the book in the right hand. And words cannot describe the misery of those who meet their Creator and receive the book in the left hand. So we really have to ask ourselves today, what kind of story are we presenting our Lord? Islam is the instructions for how to present a story that our Lord will love and that we will be happy to present and have presented for us on the Day of Judgment. Is it a story of sacrifice? Is it a story of patience? Is it a story of compassion and of service and of charity? Or is it a story of anger and hate and greediness and selfishness? Appreciating our faith will help us write the absolute best story possible. And the truth of the matter is, yes, we're the authors. And the beautiful thing about being the authors is right now, we can literally erase our whole story and start fresh. We just ask God for forgiveness. We get a clean slate. And then we write the kind of story we wish to have presented when we meet Him. But we don't know when the pen will be lifted. And when our soul leaves our body, you can't edit that story anymore. And we'll be judged most intensely according to the last chapter, the final days, the final words. So what kind of story are we writing that we will present our Lord? Is it a story of sacrificing the deen or sacrificing for the deen? And that was the main point I wanted to get to. In that our faith, it is the greatest gift we have from Allah. Greater than even our existence. Because to exist without knowing where we came from, who we are with and where we are going, that is a life, a, a blind life, a heedless life, a miserable life. Faith teaches us why we are here, where we came from, where we are and where we are going. It is the greatest gift that we have. And ultimately, if we appreciate this gift, then we will never sacrifice our faith. We will sacrifice for our faith, but we will not sacrifice our faith. And as Muslims, really, we can fall into one of two categories. Those who sacrifice our relationship with Allah, and those who sacrifice for our relationship with Allah. Those who sacrifice our deen, and those who sacrifice for our deen. And there's a world of difference between the two. May Allah bless us to be those who sacrifice for faith, not sacrifice our faith. And that's the biggest danger of Islamophobia. It isn't the hate crimes and you know, uh, whatever problems we may face and discrimination that we fight at care day and night. But the biggest problem when it comes to Islamophobia is when out of fearing people more than we fear Allah or out of loving people more than we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we sacrifice our faith instead of sacrificing for our faith. May Allah protect us from that. Really, as American Muslims, we're privileged, extremely privileged. We have it easy here in this land. Allah's given us everything we need to freely practice our faith in America. 
and this freedom and this liberty that Allah has given us will either be a proof for us or against us on the Day of Judgment. The Constitution will be a proof for us or against us on the Day of Judgment. If we, alhamdulillah, embrace the liberty this country offers us and use this to serve our faith through serving others while proudly holding on to our faith, that is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and something Allah will love. And that's the best way to challenge Islamophobia. I was reading on the way here how Israel has shot 750 unarmed protesters, killing a couple dozen. The world doesn't bat an eye. Muslim leaders come and they hang out with Hollywood celebrities drinking tequila, a'udhu billah, and they don't raise a word against this injustice that is happening. That is the impact of Islamophobia. The blood of Muslims in the world has become so cheap that our own so-called leaders come and hang out in Hollywood and they don't dare speak out against the injustice and the oppression that has happened. Rather, they are complicit in it. Muslims throughout the world pay the price of our lack of political involvement, our lack of standing up for our faith. In another part of the Muslim world, Dozens of children, many of whom are Hafaz, graduated, killed in Afghanistan. Muslim blood has become cheap. And that's a result of Islamophobia, which dehumanizes the Palestinian victims, which dehumanizes the Syrian civilians that are slaughtered, which dehumanizes the Afghani children that are blown up by U.S. drone strikes. So their blood becomes cheap. Meanwhile, we're living the life of luxury here in this country. We will be asked about this life of luxury. We are in the best position to challenge Islamophobia in America. And by challenging Islamophobia, we can inshallah grow a greater respect and love in the world for the Muslim community and in America and hopefully make it politically dangerous for policies that take the lives of innocent children abroad or even innocent people in America every single day now. Every single day we hear about one of our unarmed African American brothers and sisters, whether they're Muslim or not, they're brothers and sisters in humanity being gunned down. Stephen Clark, 20 bullets fired at him, hit about eight times in his own backyard, unarmed. Just a couple days ago, another unarmed African American man in New York City holding a shower head, gunned down. See, when people are not connected with their Creator, they don't value the blood of the creation of their Creator. And Islam came as a solution to that. See, when, when Allah created humanity, the angels asked, are you going to create those who will spill blood? They knew that would be a defining characteristic of humanity, not of all humanity, but of those who are disconnected with their Creator. And therefore Rasulullah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as a rahmah, as a mercy to all that is within creation. And we are supposed to be those who reflect his message of mercy in this land. So by strongly holding on to our faith, by holding on to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the message of rahmah, of mercy that our Prophet was sent with, we can start to build a respect for human dignity and human life in this land and abroad. But if we're sitting back as unarmed African Americans are killed in the streets in this land, and Palestinian children are massacred by the U.S. government's ally, and Muslim children in Pakistan and Afghanistan are blown up by drone strikes, and all we're worried about is our 401k and our retirement and our future, I don't know how we're going to stand before Allah on the Day of Judgment. We're either part of the problem or part of the solution. And you know what the solution is? It's simple. Love your faith, appreciate your faith, and then... Take on the beautiful qualities that Allah loves of the believers. In Allah yuhibbu al Allah loves those who do good. You can't get close to the Creator if you're not serving His creation. Be part of the solution through service to humanity while holding on to the title of Muslim. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Allah says, who's better in speech than those who do good? And say, I am of the Muslims. But if we're hiding our identity, we're not changing the narrative. We don't need to tell people what we are not. We need to show them what we are. The best solution to Islamophobia, to violence, to the problems our society is facing, is Muslim youth who proudly hold on to their faith and proudly represent their faith in public while serving society. We have to use it before we lose it. And it breaks my heart too often. I see our brothers and our sisters 
sacrificing their faith, sacrificing the sunnas that are becoming more and more rare, out of fearing people, out of loving people, or out of seeking this temporary world that will leave us before we know it. Sacrifice for your faith, my brothers and sisters. Don't sacrifice your faith. If you really appreciate what a gift Islam is, you would never sacrifice any of its teachings for the sake of pleasing others. You wouldn't, or out of fear of others. You wouldn't. But it's only when we don't really recognize what a great gift Islam is, that it's the vehicle by which I can be connected with the creator of the heavens and the earth, and I can love him and he can love me. When we don't recognize that's what Islam is, at that point, then we start willing to sacrifice our faith. And if we don't appreciate it, it's okay, because Allah doesn't need us. And the faith doesn't need us. And Allah promises that if you don't appreciate this faith that I've sent to you, then I will replace you with the people who do appreciate it. A people who are humble with each other and strong against the oppressors. That's the quality of the believers. With each other, they are humble. And they are strong against the aggressors and the unjust. Sometimes we take the opposite approach. <laughs> we're strong with each other. We're strong with our spouses. We're strong maybe with our children. And we're weak against the oppressors. That is the definition of a weak person. Strong against those weaker than him. And weak against those who appear stronger than him. Whereas the believer, he's afraid of none but God and seeks nothing but the pleasure of God and is humble with those weaker than him and standing strong against those who oppress others and who wrong others. Those are the qualities of faith that are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I read a very disturbing study that emphasizes this point and the danger of not appreciating our faith. One of the studies shown that 23% of children born into Muslim families in America identify themselves as not Muslim. 23%, that's one in five kids born to Muslim families in America say they are not Muslim. And that's the natural result of generations that encourage people to hide their faith outwardly. See, when we hide our faith outwardly today, we're encouraging the possibility that people hide it inwardly tomorrow. When Islam disappears publicly today, it may disappear privately tomorrow. But the other amazing statistic, watching God's promise come true, it also said that 23% of Muslims in America are converts. So Allah is replacing the exact number that leaves, that's not appreciative, with the number of people who are appreciative. So don't take this gift of faith, my brothers and sisters, for granted. Recognize that if we don't use this faith to serve humanity, while proudly representing the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we'll be replaced with people that do. And if you really consider yourself a believer and you really appreciate your faith, then just ask yourself a simple question. I believe in Allah on the last day, I believe in the day of judgment, I believe Prophet Muhammad was a messenger of Allah. So how am I and how is my life different than those who don't believe? What is the difference between me and those who don't know their Creator, don't love their Creator and don't believe they will stand before their Creator? If there's no difference, then do you really believe? And what is that difference? Is that difference just 45 minutes a day that we spend in our Salah? Or is there more than that? Make sure you have some qualities that set you up as a lover of God. And again, there's no better way to have that status than reviving the sunnahs of Rasulullah in your life and serving others while constantly remembering your Creator, being connected with the scholars, having the best character and conduct, treating people in the best of ways, whether you're angry or happy, having the best akhlaq. Nothing scares people away from religion than people who maybe try to hold on to the religion outwardly, but then have the worst conduct with each other privately. Remembering that He is with you wherever you are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us steadfast and use us to share the beauty of this deen in this world. Use us to become a means of guidance for humanity. While ourselves and our family being guided first and foremost. May our story that we receive in our right hand be a story of sacrificing for the deen, not sacrificing the deen. What a difference between the two. This is why, and I'll finish with the, the translation of the verses that we began in our khutbah with, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is not befitting 
for the people of Medina and those surrounding them that they remain behind the Messenger of Allah, that the, Rus the Messenger of God goes forward to serve the deen and they stay back, nor that they prefer themselves over him. When we turn away from his sunnahs, when we turn away from his teachings, it's a form of preferring ourselves over him. Allah says, it is not befitting. Why? Because they are, you, they are not afflicted by thirst or fatigue or hunger in the path of God, nor do they tread on any ground that angers the oppressors. In other words, the oppressors see Muslims outwardly, proudly representing their faith, and the oppressors become angry that we're spending millions trying to demonize Islam, and yet they're still wearing their hijab, they're still growing their beards, they're still uh, helping the homeless, they're still feeding the poor, they're still standing up for the oppressed, they're not getting intimidated by our tactics, so they become angry. Allah says they don't take a step that angers the enemies of faith, nor do they inflict upon the oppressors any infliction, except that it is written for them as a righteous deed. Allah does not lose the reward of those who do good. So be steadfast. And don't be afraid of what challenges you face in seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And put your trust fully in Allah. My brothers and sisters, sometimes we talk about having trust in God. And really it's easy to have trust in God when everything is going easy for us. And when we are finding success. But that doesn't mean we trust in Allah. That means we're trusting in our means. And the means Allah has given us. True trust in God is displayed when things look like they're going in the wrong direction. And we're facing tremendous difficulties in our life. Maybe difficulties because we hold on to our faith. And we lose hope in all the means. And everything looks like it's going in the wrong way. But we have that love of God in our hearts and that we know. Allah says, وَمَا Whoever has their trust in God, know that God is all-powerful, all-wise. That we trust in His wisdom, that He will deliver us to success in this life and the next. So put your trust in God, hold on to your faith, and serve others in the best of ways. May Allah make us a means of guidance for humanity. May Allah make us a means of mercy in this land. May Allah make us beloved to those who are oppressed, not beloved to the oppressors. May Allah make us a means of victory to those who are wrong, of help to the poor and the needy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our life and our hearts with love for Him and love for His Messenger and truly make us the best representatives of His message of mercy to humanity that through our service to others we become a means of guidance for humanity and mercy to the world and mercy to all creation as our beloved Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent with. Uh, inshallah, please move forward, move forward, make room for those that have come late. Walhamdulillah.